strengthens track wind condition, which push the warm water further towards the maritime continent, where the temperature are more um, warmer and very, very intense. So the convection are concentrated and also intense. Uh, and again, it is Bjorkini feedback. So this temperature gradient dry uh, intensified track wind, stronger upwelling, uh, deeper, uh, more slopey thermocline, and so on. So, and it has huge impact, and that's why we are so interested in it. For example, the 1997-1998, which is the largest El Nino uh, on record. So, this is the, uh, the picture in Peru, uh, Ecuador region flooding, marine life died en masse because the food they prey on, the anchovy, anchovy uh, it was no longer there because of the warm temperature and lack of upwelling. Uh, and during um, during such El Nino events in Australia, we tend to have drought. Um, for example, in 82-83, we have dust storm in Melbourne. The Ash Wednesday bushfire is um, in a way in a way condition preconditioned and forced by the drought associated with forced by the the second strongest extreme El Nino in 82-83. And in South Pacific, the South Pacific Convergence Zone normally swing towards equator where the east is warming uh, by two, three hundred kilometers during El Nino and, and move away from uh, equator from each climate logical position during La Nina. But during some years, it could swing hugely by a thousand kilometers towards um, equator and causing huge impact, which I'll talk about it a little bit. <clears throat> and during La Nina, for example, the 1998 La Nina, uh, after the extreme El Nino, uh, we had huge flood in Brisbane, in China during that year, um, more than 10,000 people died and, and more than 200 million people uh, displaced, homeless because of the, the huge flood. Uh, in, if you see the last El Nino, 2015-16, so in July 2016, Wuhan now, a famous city, it's also flooded uh, and so on. Um, the, the impact are, are huge and, and the damage and the cost of the human life and the damage to property infrastructure is in the billions. Uh, in fact, El Nino affect, also affects all sorts of conditions, affect the Indian Ocean dipole, Availability of Atlantic Indonesian through flow and the downstream ocean circulation interact with um, PDO and also uh, interaction with MJO and affects the property of tropical cyclone, monsoon, and so on. So basically, the impact is is very very uh, in many many uh, area uh, and in many many systems. So we often use. Nino 3 SST, a sea surface temperature, to describe ENSO. And these days, people use Nino 3 more to describe the Eastern Pacific ENSO event. So now we know there are two systems uh, Eastern Pacific El Nino, which has the anomaly center in the east, and Central Pacific El Nino, which can be described by Nino 4, Central Pacific El Nino. So this, these are the SST. Um, sort of index, sea surface temperature index, which is a fundamental field to study ENSO. So how ENSO SST will respond to climate change, to greenhouse warming, has been a long uh, challenging issue uh, for many decades. And there are many reviews in 2010, our review shows that if you look at the uh, Nino 3 standard deviation, Nino 3 standard deviation changes um, in a bunch of climate models, basically there is no consensus. Um, and that non-consensus um, continued to five years later when a second review paper was uh, was called for. Um, basically, if you look at uh, climate models um, in the pre-industrial um, Nino 3 standard deviation. Uh, so here is a 5 percentile, 95 percentile uh, 
average, a multimodal average, and a median. So 20th century RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5. Basically, there is um, so no discernible difference. The difference is has such a huge uncertainty that uh, we still can't say how the uh, in terms of linear three Enzo may change under greenhouse warming. However, there are very strong intermodal consensus, and I, I, I need to stress that it is model. So it doesn't mean that this is this is true when every model when every model agrees, right? But nevertheless, these are the consensus. So there's a weakening water circulation. We know this is a weakening walk, this is water circulation. This is weakening with a faster warming in the eastern equatorial Pacific. There is the um, increasing temperature gradient, vertical temperature gradient. Uh, so basically, you have the upper ocean warm faster. So you look at the thermocline, doesn't matter how you define them, whether it's the maximum temperature gradient or the 20 degrees C isotherm depth. The um, thermocline are shallows uh, under greenhouse conditions. So uh, compared to the present day in black, yeah. And maritime continent half is, is the continent. So maritime continent warms faster than the ocean adjacent to it. And you also, if you do average across equator, the, um, there's a faster warming in the equatorial region than off equator. So these are very, these are the features in the mean state change that are featured in almost every model. Um, and so, our first um, attempt was to see, well, we know this change, what will be the implications for, for properties of ENSO variability. So we look at rainfall in state, given that temperature um, variability um, doesn't show any consensus. So here is a study looking at the South Pacific convergence zone. We know that the um, equatorial is warming faster and convergence zone in the tropics try to occur, always try to occur, move to where the maximum temperature is. So, um, and I mentioned about in 82, 83, in this extreme El Nino and in some El Nino, this SPCJ shift towards equator by a thousand kilometers, causing a drought and flood in different countries. Importantly, it also takes um, tropical cyclone genesis, which normally is um, about 400, 500 kilometers south of the convergence towards the north and causing huge impact in regions, not normally expecting to see uh, tropical cyclones. And because this is warming faster in one of the first study, we show that this kind of frequency of big swing, swings towards the equator uh, doubles under greenhouse warming because of this mean state change. We also look at the uh, extreme El Ninos in terms of the impacts. So this is the extreme El Nino composite, basically two events, 82, 83 and 97, 98. In December, January and February, which is the season where, the season when uh, El Nino matures. And what we are seeing is the temperature in color. And so this the purple is the uh, 28 degrees C isotherm in the boundary of warm pool. So during such events, extreme events, the warm pool spread across the whole equatorial Pacific. And this is the green curve. The green curve is the rainfall greater than five millimeter per day, average over DJF season. You can see this rainfall also spread across to the normally very cold and dry uh, region. So if you then take a temperature gradient um, between this red box of Equatoria and the yellow box, and so the uh, difference um, red box average uh, take away minus the, uh, the, 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 the yellow box. This, this gradient is negative, meaning maximum temperature is actually at the equator, at the eastern equatorial Pacific. So the intertropical convergence 
zone moved towards the eastern equatorial Pacific during such extreme El Nino events. So if you plot the meridional gradient um, and the eastern equatorial Pacific rainfall, you can see there is a strong nonlinear relationship. So during such events, 97, 98 rainfall, almost an order of magnitude larger. And that's why it caused huge reorganization of the MSX circulation, huge rainfall flooding in Ecuadorian and Peruvian region. And so this is the 2015, um, 16 events. So one characteristic is all this is in all this rainfall anomaly that's so large, they are all greater than five millimeter. Uh, I mean, when we did that study in 2014, we don't have this event. So we took five millimeter as a measure of the, of the rainfall. And so this is a, there's a very strong rainfall skewness, right? And you can use the skewness to see whether a model can produce this nonlinear view or not to select models. So using the five millimeter per day, DJF average rainfall as a, a, a definition of extreme El Nino events. We can then look at this relationship in climate models in present day and future. So the conceptual advance here is that for extreme El Nino events, you can't just use this convergence or movement from west to east. You also have to look at the uh, meridional movement of the ITCZ from north to the eastern equatorial Pacific. And that is why those, um, those rainfall anomaly, those uh, MSR circulation anomaly are so huge because the ITCZ, the main convection is, has moved during this event to, uh, to this eastern equatorial Pacific. And so we choose, we select 20 models Symmetry three and symmetry five models that are able to produce this sort of nonlinear relationship. And each, each experiment is under climate change forcing of equivalent to RCP uh, 8.5. So we have 100 years for each model during this period in, as a present day climate, for example, and that is a future. So we have 20,000 years of virtual climate in the present day and in the future. And these events in the present day is about one in 20 events, 100 over 20, over 2000, right? And in the future, it doubles. So from one in 20 years to one in 10 years. And there is a very strong intermodal consensus, uh, 17 out of 20 models showing an increase of such extreme El Nino events. If you use this convection movement as your definition, uh, as your um, uh, criteria to, to describe uh, extreme El Nino. And so, <clears throat> so this is the, the paper. So basically the mechanism is reasonably simple. This is warming faster than the surrounding regions. In the present day climate, it may take two units to contour here of SST anomaly to drive convection um, from west to east and ITC jet from north to the equatorial region. In the future climate, because this is already warming faster, it's easier to create a maximum warming in this region. So it would take less than two units of this anomaly to drive similar mass reorganization of the atmospheric circulation. And so that is an extreme, that is the extreme El Nino's response to uh, to, um, to, to greenhouse warming in the absence of no consensus of SST. Because even if SST variability does not change, because it's warming faster, it's, it's easier to generate such convection movement. <clears throat> and in a recent study, my postdoc, uh, we did this study trying to address how the Paris Agreement may change the story of that uh, result. So we know that Paris Agreement aims at limiting 
climate change uh, greenhouse warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees relative to the industrial. And so we look at a few models that is forced under a scenario that could take us to there, RCP 2.6 to 1.5 and stabilize at, uh, at, at 1.5 to 2 degrees. So here is this meridional gradient reversing the sign. So we use 31 years of sliding window, calculate the meridional gradient in red color, reversing the sign. And the global wind temperature, so you move your window, 30, 31 years, sliding windows. So the global wind temperature is in, in black color with a, with a, uh, a shadow indicating this, the, the spread. So stabilized, the temperature stabilized at around 2050. But this meridian gradient continued to weaken for another century. And in this picture, we show the frequency. Again, we count the frequency. We have five models and we average them and we do this uh, spread. This uh, frequency continued to increase for also an, about a century. So the maximum risk of extreme El Nino events is not at where the where you, you stabilize your current uh, your your global wind, global wind temperature it actually continues for another uh, while up to a century. <clears throat> so the bottom line here is that under climate change um, rainfall sensitivity to sea surface temperature variability even if that variability does not change is greater is greater and that could cause more extreme uh, El Nino if you measure the El Nino in terms of impact up to that start. And so in terms of sea surface temperature this struggle continues. So um, again we take the same approach we try to look at just the extreme events uh, just the extreme event how because if you do Nino 3 or whatever a Nino 4 standard deviation you are mixing all the events, you don't separate extreme from moderate. And so we, um, we do this, um, we look at this sort of uh, extreme events. Um, so one of the feature is this weakening water circulation that I'm going to talk about. And the weakening water circulation meaning that the trade wind will be weakened. Now the trade wind weakens, the upper oceanic current will also weaken. Right, so this trade wind actually drive an upper oceanic current, also blowing from east, flowing from east to west. So I'm going to talk to you about this very classic um, problem of Enzo. So here is a, a, a an evolution of sea surface temperature along the equator and going upwards with time. One of the feature here is in these extreme El Nino events. The anomaly propagate from west to east, or we call eastward propagating events, right? Uh, and so, um, ever since this event, scientists are trying to find out why, because it's a bit odd. The mean current and the wind flow from east to west, but these anomalies propagating in an opposite directions. So, in, in this study, uh, others show that this eastward propagation is possible because the anomaly, the trade wind anomaly, the westerly wind anomaly is so strong it actually reverses the upper oceanic current. So this is a time series of upper oceanic current from 1950 to 2012, something like that. And the mean will be a negative value flowing from east to west. But during this extreme event, it reverses. The, the, uh, the upper oceanic current reverses, facilitating the eastward propagation. And this has implications. Um, <clears throat> because we had a weakening water circulation, this mean current will weaken. So even if the variability of the current does not change, you may have more occurrences of this reversal of oceanic currents, and therefore you may have more eastward propagating events. And indeed, if you look at the frequency of eastward propagating events in 38 SIMIT 3 and SIMIT 5 models. And here is the frequency being in terms of the Nino 3 normalized. You can see the future 
and the present day, yeah, the neutral frequency increased dramatically, but many of them, in, many of the increase occur when the linear three index is actually not very big, right, not very big. So this issue of how extreme El Nino in terms of SSC may respond to greenhouse warming is left open by the time of that study. Now, in terms of extreme La Nina, um, it has we can we can look at look at it because we know that um, during extreme El Nino events, um, convection is more intense, more concentrated in the um, in the maritime continent, and maritime continent is warming faster than this region, than the of equator, than the um, uh, Central Pacific region, and also the um, you have um, increased temperature gradient. The thermal current is shallow, so normally uh, La Nina's core center is in the Central Pacific, and Central Pacific the thermal current is very deep. It's actually not easy for the um, subthermal current cold water to influence the surface. It only occurs when after normally occurs after the El Nino when the thermal current is shallow, when the equatorial Pacific heat is discharged to the atmosphere or to the mid uh, or the mid latitude. So with this shallow thermal current, you may have more chance of generating um, uh, cold anomaly relative to the warm climate, of course. So we look at <clears throat> we look at how extreme La Nina may respond to climate change. So the extreme La Nina, if you compare weak and extreme, that they, are, they both have the center of Central Pacific region. But the extremes, the cooling is more intense, the cooling extends a bit further towards the maritime continent, pushing further the warm water towards the maritime continent. And this easterly wind is further uh, towards the maritime continent. So you can actually use a, a temperature gradient between maritime continent and central Pacific to, to depict extreme La Nina. <clears throat> so this is linear three um, standard deviation, um, uh, anomaly, sorry, anomalies, and this is the zonal temperature gradient. And you can see there's a nice relation. So you pick up these two extreme La Nina event of the 20th century, 88 and 97. And you can define as when the linear four um, is um, greater than 1.75 standard deviation in amplitude. And you can use this relationship properly to train in the model, to train them, a quadratic to train the linear four SSTs and so on. And you can see how La Nina will respond. And again, we, just, we have the same deal. Um, 100 years in the control period, another 100 years in the climate change period. By the time of this study, we used all the simplified models. We've got 21 models that are able to simulate extreme El Nino. And in this case, we now have uh, 17 out of 21 models generating um, an increase in in La Nina. So in the present day climate, 2100, you got 92. So that's about one in 23 years or so. <clears throat> and in the future, it's, it's a 75% increase. And you may like to see this bracket number. Bracket number are the extreme La Nina occur the year after an extreme El Nino, like what happened in 97, 98. And you can see the majority of increase um, in, the, uh, in the extreme La Nina in future climate occur after an extreme El Nino event. So this kind of swinging from you know, extreme from one extreme El Nino to La Nina, this kind of sequence uh, is likely to increase in frequency and uh, greenhouse warming condition. So we are now we are picking the extreme events. So how about in general what the SST variability would be? And so that is still left open by now, right? We look at eastward propagating, we look at extreme La Nina, and we look at in terms of rainfall, extreme El Nino may respond. So 
we are coming back to the SST availability issue. So this is a 35 cement, 34 cement fire models in terms of linear three standard deviation um, in the present day in blue and in the future in red color. So we have 16 out of 34 models produced a decreased variability in linear three. That means the other 18 is an increase, about half and half using linear three. But what is implied by linear three, by using linear three? If you are using linear three for all model, you will be saying that every model simulate the same anomaly center as in the observed. Linear three is the observed center. So, so that is a paper, this is a paper that published in uh, December 2018, uh, just looking at that uh, SST variability in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific. We now know that there are two regimes of Enzo. We have strong El Nino in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific, the anomaly center. We have moderate in the Central Pacific, the La Nina, the center, uh, more to the Central Pacific, um, but the pattern is not mirror image opposite of the, uh, of the extreme um, El Nino. It means that to capture ENSO, you need two indexes, right? You can't use one indexes because if, if you use one indexes, you would not be able to capture the, um, the diversity of Central Pacific and Eastern Pacific, or the um, nonlinear asymmetric pattern of extreme El Nino and extreme La Nina. So one approach is to get two indexes, and to get two indexes, you can one approach is to use EOF analysis on sea surface temperature to get two patterns. So this is the first pattern of sea surface temperature in DJF. Uh, you can see that there's the, uh, this, this really, this is the West wind anomaly warming. This pattern is actually the average of all, all patterns of ENSO. And the second one um, is used to modulate, to modify this pattern, to give you this diversity and asymmetry through linear combination. So if you look at the relationship between the associate time series, you see that um, the first pattern and the second, the first principal component and the second has a nonlinear relationship. So extreme El Nino is actually the difference between these two patterns, PC1 minus PC2. So you'll get this pattern and that could be approximated by Nino 3. The extreme La Nina is when these two patterns are both negative. So um, add them up, reverse the sign. These two patterns, the sum of the two, reverse the sign, you get the La Nina. And all you, all you just add them up, you get the uh, CPL Nina. This is a CPL Nina pattern, anomaly in the Central Pacific. So we have two indexes, E index and C index. And, and that allow you to, the minimum really, to describe the, um, the asymmetric nonlinear feature of ENSO. <clears throat> so extreme La Nina is just the reversing sign of this pattern and, and, um, and, and the amplitude is bigger than the CPL Nina, right? <clears throat> so um, we can follow many other studies, include Digma, Takahashi, to describe this nonlinear relationship and we use all the observed and we, we describe we can write the nonlinear relationship in terms of a quadratic relationship. PC2 is a nonlinear function of PC1 and so on. And this alpha is a measure of these nonlinearities. Alpha, when you uh, average across all the, uh, yeah, aggregated across all the observed is about minus 0.31. Uh, now let's look at the e index in the observation and C index. So this is from around 50 to 2017. This is an E index constructed by, by this, by this, um, by this, right? So the E index shows 
that extreme El Nino in 1997, 82, 83, 72, 73, right? So uh, extreme La Nina, 80, 1998, 90, uh, 1988, right? So these two index had skewness, right? So E index is positive skewness. So it means warm anomaly is able to grow bigger amplitude, much, much bigger than cold anomaly in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific. But in the Central Pacific, cold anomaly, you got negative skewness. Cold anomaly is able to grow bigger than warm anomaly. Or oh, La Nina is bigger than CP El Nino in terms of amplitude. So by this definition, by this definition, because E index would have a pattern associated with it. The center of positive skewness is the center of EP ENSO events. And the center of negative skewness is the center of CPL events by, by definition, right? And a lot of study has also found out why we have these nonlinearities. Of course, there are a lot of nonlinear process in the ocean and atmosphere, but one of the key one is that is the convection um, and the associate nonlinear response of zonal wind anomaly towards sea surface temperature. So this is the sea surface temperature in in terms of sea index, and this is the wind response. <clears throat> and you can see that in the Central Pacific, yes, you can easily much easier to to establish convection because it's already quite warm. So once Convection is established, the wind response to SST increase. But if you look at this slope, and this slope, the ratio is about 1.5. Now, in the eastern equatorial Pacific, that ratio is much bigger. And why? Because it is normally cold and dry. You need to warm and warm, warm a lot before convection can establish. And that's what happened in extreme El Nino. So when it's when the warm anomaly is so strong that it the convection established there and rainfall, the whole circulation anomaly is huge. So it warm a little bit, then once warm a lot, and then convection established, and then the response of wind to SST um, uh, then increased dramatically compared to before that convection established. So 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 you now have two El Nino systems. One tend to occur here because convection is easy. And the other one is once you move away from the Central Pacific, you need to warm quite a lot to establish this convection. So you've got the EP El Nino regime to occur there. But after you have a strong El Nino, then the heat discharge, shallow thermocline, and that would precondition for a La Nina in the year after or also, right? So that's why you have all this asymmetry, but this nonlinear response is thought to be the key of those nonlinear property that we are seeing in ENSO. Now we can do this EOF analysis um, to all the 34 parameter models, and you can construct the E index, and you can construct the E pattern, Eastern Pacific El Nino pattern. So this is two models. One give you this pattern. The other one give you this pattern. Both are reasonable models. They are very different. They are hugely different in terms of the locations. They are, it is not appropriate to use linear three as in the observed because the model, right? Instead, the model center is quite different. Instead, we should look at how E index variability may change under greenhouse warming conditions rather than linear through. Um, so, if we do that, this is the 34 models uh, in terms of the E index. Now, we have 24 models generating an increase. Previously, uh, only 18. So, the consensus is, 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 um, is in enhancing. Is enhanced. <clears throat> but EOF analysis really is a mathematical procedure. It doesn't guarantee physics, right? It doesn't guarantee physics. 
So in the, in the observation, we know it's very laminar. In the observation, we got these three numbers, alpha, E index skewness, and C index skewness. What are the relationship between them? So we calculate for all the models. Um, so this is the skewness of E index. Uh, positive means more minority can go bigger than negative anomalies in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific. And this is the alpha, and we got 34 of those. This is the observed. This is the observed. Now, the greater the alpha in amplitude, the greater the positive skewness. The correlation is 0.92, and, and it's a beautiful relationship. Um, I want to go here first. Yep. And then the negative skewness also increases in, in amplitude with alpha. And so alpha really elegantly describes these two uh, parameters, right? So the observed, as I say, is here, and, and about the majority of models pr produce two weak nonlinearities, but about half of the models generate half of the observed value on um, yeah, half of the half of the uh, half of the observed value. So if we select those half, those seventeen models. Right, this is the nonlinear relationship, which is reasonable. The other half, the other 17 model, is not as good. So, <clears throat> we should, in fact, focus on these 17 models, right? And this, and use alpha to select these 17 models because it means those nonlinear properties. It, the greater the alpha, it means that the better the model could simulate as distinguishable, the two distinguishable center of EP and CP, the anomaly center. So here are just some of the good models, right? And some of the not so good models, and unfortunately our access 1.3 is not that good. You can see these are very different from the observed. <clears throat> And if you look at the 17 models in terms of this nonlinear wind response to SST, right? This index, the ratio is 2.5, is not as good as observed 3.5. Um, but in the C, the ratio is almost the same. So in, in the selected model, you can see this nonlinear are not too bad and a bit weak, as we know. Focusing on that 17 models now, you see that 15 out of the 17 models produce an increased variability. Now that's a lot better, right? So, and that translates into a 50% increase in the frequency of extreme El Nino events defined as when the DJF, the peak season event, so index greater than 1.5 standard deviation. Now I want to talk a little bit about the mechanism. So under greenhouse warming, the upper ocean is warming faster than the, uh, than, than the ocean below. So the, the gradient the stratification is stronger. That means the same amount of wind is acting on a shallow thermocline. And so you have a stronger coupling between the ocean and the atmosphere. And you can quantify this gradient change, averaging the temperature here, take away at 100 meter depth, and you can plot against the change in the E index. So this is a change in the vertical gradient, and this is a change in the E index. This is per degree of global warming because different model has different sense climate sensitivity. So you, you normalize to allow, to allow the comparisons. And you can see that, um, uh, the majority of models produce an increased variability, and the greater the change, the greater the enhancement in the gradient, the greater the change. However, the model still had a huge spread. <clears throat> and you can do the same thing to, to, to C index, although the consensus is not as strong. So now on that 17 models, uh, 10 produce an increase, 7 produce a reduced variability, CPL Nino frequency, uh, uh, CPL Nino uh, occurrence also increased uh, in, in, 
in, um, in 11 out of the 17 models. La Nina, extreme La Nina, CP index greater than minus um, in amplitude 1.75, um, also increased as in previous paper. Now, I mentioned about a lot of uh, a lot of spread. <clears throat> we need to understand why there is this spread. And to do that, we use uh, 40 experiments from this model, which has an alpha of reasonable good value, similarly observed. And the only difference in this exper in this set of experiments is a tiny perturbation, uh, 10 to the power of minus 14 in surface temperature in starting from 1920. Um, and here is the global mean temperature, almost very similar, the mean warm pattern, which we talk about, uh, reasonable in intensified stratification, average across the 14 models, 40 models, 40 experiments. And this is the variability pattern of ENSO in this model, not too bad. But even everything exactly the same, except a little bit different in the initial condition. The present day, the, the first 50 years after this, after greenhouse warming, uh, uh, this is still RCP 8.5. The first 50 years and the last 50 years are very, very different. Although you can see that most of model, most of experiments show an increase, but it's very different. Exactly the same model. The only difference is a tiny butterfly touch. Why? I want to show you this slide. So here is a, a double pendulum mimicking ENSO system and the releasing mimicking a little bit of difference in, in ENSO. Because it's nonlinear, it has thresholds. Threshold reverses feedback amplifier or, or dams. So once it couldn't go to a threshold, the evolution is completely different. So you will start to see the difference. Now this one couldn't get, couldn't get to the swing and it become different. And, and it will never ever the same from one each other. I could have 40 put it up here, but this is, I just saw it from the, from, from, from the net. It really captured what I'm going to talk about. I was trying, I'm trying to talk about, yeah? So, although you have the same model, the same forcing, but because of stochastic, because of the butterfly touch, if you have, initially you have a El Nino, it may be followed by a La Nina. If you have, initially you have La Nina, you may persist into next year. If the initially, the initial year, if a neutral state, then the next year could be El Nino, neutral, or La Nina. And after that, the evolution can never be the same. Although everything is the same, except um, everything else is the same. The greenhouse forcing, the model is the same. So it is quite random, right? But it is not random. It is not completely random. <clears throat> so here is a, a, a picture showing the initial response in terms of a standard deviation of E index and the change in the future. And this is the same model, you don't have to scale them. The global mean temperature is the same. So what we are seeing here is that initially, if you had a smaller, if the ENSO variability is weaker, the future change is much bigger and the relationship is very strong. In other words, this ENSO's response to climate change has a conscience. It seems to remember its past own behavior and then modu modulate its own response down the track accordingly. So we know, we still don't know a lot about El Nino. So, so this, I'm going to stop here because this is a paper under review and I hope to give this talk later. <clears throat> I, I think I'm running out of my time. So to conclude, I, I think I tell you a, a story that a journey that we have been through, but the upshot here is the model produce a very different ENSO. But if you look at the variability at each own model's anomaly center, you tend to get a much better consensus. Uh, 
consensus that extreme El Nino, extreme La Nina, uh, and the associated extreme would, would, would increase in frequency. And that has implications. As we know in, in Australia, you know, one of the countries most affected by, by ENSO. So thank you very much. Thank you, Wenju, for a wonderful talk. Um, it was fascinating to see um, all of the nuances and challenges in um, creating these models and, um, and using them to make predictions. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to invite people to begin by just giving Wenju a clap. So you can do that um, in your reaction part of your screen and um, put up a little clap sign because we were talking about this. <laughs> as, <laughs> I see that. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> it's really hard because you don't get a response. <laughs> so when you, you can, um, scroll down and see all the claps that you're getting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I'd like to invite anyone with a question to um, put up their hand. This is great. This is great. It was so clear. <laughs> what's next? Uh, I mean, what's next in this research? Yes, what's next in this research? Oh, yes, and there's a lot. I, I'm, I, I talk about, you know, we need to understand why the system that seems to be very random, but it also has some systematic tendencies. And I think understanding those is, is actually important in terms of reducing the, um, the uh, uncertainty of, those, of the projection that we are, we, are, we, are, we are giving out. And so I think, yeah, understanding what drives <clears throat> that spread apart from stochastic. And I show you even in stochastic, there are some rules this is just one of the one of the result that yeah even in a stochastic there are some there are some some rule that we need to understand right why should yeah why why would this relationship so strong and I think in in this space we are not fully um, we are, we don't fully understand the uh, the interaction between patients um, for example whether Atlantic forcing of the Pacific or the IOT's forcing of the Pacific will change uh, in, in the future and, and whether climate models are actually capturing those interactions. Yeah, and that, that's another very uh, important area. Um, and so the other one, I guess, is really try to understand the impact. So at the moment, these models still has a very low resolution. And when we, if we are able to uh, get into higher resolution with this result holds and would, um, would, um, would the impact be stronger than what we are seeing? Uh, and so when you go to regional, it become very interesting. For example, we know that the Antarctic, a lot of recent changes due to tropical availabilities. Uh, and, and, but we are not able to simulate them because our resolution in models, we are not able to capture the ice, icy ocean interaction or the tropical tidal connections impact on the uh, Antarctic circulation. So I think there are a lot to go from here. Oh, it certainly sounds like it. Thank you. Um, so we have a um, lineup of questions here now. So yeah. Greg, I'm going to turn over to you. At first. Hi. Brad, go ahead. You might have to. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, it was it was fantastic. I get sense when I look at the physical data for the Western Pacific warm pool. Mm. 
that it is getting deeper and warmer and expanding in latitude right. north. And during one of the most recent uh, predicted El Ninos, it was not as, well, it was an El Nino, but it wasn't as deep and strong as people at Syro predicted in the lead up to it. And mm -hmm. it was that the western part of the Western Pacific warm pool didn't get as cold as a strong El Nino typically does. Right. I wonder if that is because as that warm water moves east, there's still a lot of warm water left behind. And whether that's actually buffering your system in terms of what happens in terms of the severity of the El Nino and that gradient from east to west. Right, right. And I just want to get your... Yes, yes. So, um, and a very good question, of course. I mean, the recent, I, I, I thought you were referring to the recent El Nino, right? So the yeah. recent El Nino occurs on a condition that in, we just get out of, of, of the um, hiatus, right? right? So the hiatus condition um, has the Western Pacific in a decadal scale at least, uh, warmer than normal. And so I think, yeah, so what I talk about here, of course, is an aggregation of many, many, many models. And it doesn't go and look at the, the sort of changes from one decade to another decade in terms of Enzo property and, and their behavior. So I think that, um, I think it is true it is, in the real world, it's going to be very hard to say uh, a particular event is influenced by climate change or how climate change um, is going to influence a particular event in terms of multiple respect. So, um, yeah, I think that, that again is, is still a very interesting question. For example, the last event, it's a, it's a very, very sort of out there. It is a mixture of extreme El Nino and also an extreme central Pacific El Nino, but extreme central Pacific El Nino is very unheard of because central Pacific El Nino by definition is weak. So we, it seems that the system will, give, will throw some new things at us as we progress. Just when we think that we understand a bit more um, so I think your question is very good, and I don't, I don't have. <laughs> oh no, I, I appreciate that. That's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Gemma, would you like to go ahead now? Um, thank you very much for the talk. You said that the thermocline is shallow towards the end of an El Nino event, which makes it more likely for a La Nina event to initiate. Yes. Does this mean that an El Nino event can sort of modulate its length and they have a set kind of self-modulation of their length and how long they last? Right, so basically, um, yeah, El Nino had a little bit in that ability. For example, it is almost impossible. We haven't seen one of such events where you have two extreme El Nino occur year on uh, consecutively. So once you have, but we do have for example, in 2014, 2015, where you had very weak warming. And in 2014, we were expecting a, a huge one, but it didn't occur. It was aborted by, uh, some people think that there's a, a sort of um, uh, upwelling Kelvin wave coming from, from either the high latitude or from the East, Eastern Indian Ocean. So, yeah, so if we had a very weak El Nino, it may be followed by another El Nino, but if a strong El Nino or two weak El Nino, then it will precondition a La Nina because once the heat is discharged from the Pacific, Equatorial Pacific, then you, 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 don't have the, you don't have the necessary condition for an El Nino to, to occur. So in that sense, yeah, El Nino would, you know, would, would adjust by itself, would, would, yeah, would regulate its behavior, and so would regulate its behavior. So an El Nino 
would tend to lead to a La Nina more, more, more often than not. But a La Nina may actually persist multiple years because if you have a big El Nino discharge, it will take a couple of El Nino to recharge so that the Western Pacific is, 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 uh, is, is refilled with, with the heat content. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Okay, and our um, last question will go to Jimmy and then we, if Wenju's happy, we'll ask him to stay, stay around for one-on-one -on -one questions later. Right. Hey, Wenju, great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have uh, maybe one or two questions, not very related to the surface answer you talked about, but I think these questions are related to your talk. The first thing is the first first question is about the remote links uh, of your ASO with some other processes like uh, North Atlantic deep water formation. Can you comment on that? You know, if we have some deep water formation changes in the North Atlantic Ocean, do we have some remote processes that uh, can affect ASO uh, in the Pacific Ocean? Uh, that's oh, yeah. my question. Yes, yes. Uh, there, are, <coughs> there are multiple remote processes and that has been observed. For, for example, just in our backyard, um, the uh, Eastern Australian region, right? If you have a, what we call southeast surge. So if you, <coughs> in the um, June, July, August, uh, you have the southerly wind, very strong uh, wind surges in uh, in the Eastern Australia region, those wind will blow towards the Equatoria region and Equatoria is like a wall, it will then uh, change into a westy wind. And in fact, many extreme El Nino occurs preceded by that kind of surges. So this southerly surges from the South Pacific. And, and also, of course, we know now that the tropical and the extra tropical North Pacific. And uh, so if you have the, um, if you have a weaker uh, trade wind, I mean the trade wind is from Northeast in the, in the North Pacific. If that trade wind is weaker, then it will generate um, weakened uh, evaporation and the warmer normally will then generate a, 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 a low pressure and that low pressure in turn will drive a wind anomaly which again, with re reinforcing the warm and all eventually reach the equatorial region and generate an, an El Nino. And more importantly is that this north, northeasterly trade wind in the north equator could be driven by uh, North Atlantic circulation. So if North Atlantic is cooler, then it will generate a warming in the Pacific. If North Atlantic is, is, is warmer, it will generate uh, a La Nina. So those, um, those sort of process operates on all sort of time scale, not just an Enzo time scale, it operates on decadal time scale as well. And in fact, the reason we have such a huge hiatus over the last 20 years is because the North Atlantic, uh, tropical North Atlantic, so by so 10 degree north to 20 degree north, is very, very warm over the past 20 years. And that drives this warm drive drives a cooling in the equatorial Pacific. So the negative phase of the PDO is much stronger, and that lead to this unprecedented uh, global warming hiatus because a positive, a negative PDO, uh, the associated with wind would would, um, would uh, drive a, a heat suction into the ocean. Penny? Yes? Are allowed to ask a second short question? Uh, we're a little over time. Okay, right. <laughs> so if people That's want it. to leave, um, yeah. go for right. it. Uh, let's just give um, Benji a final round of applause and then um, people can go if they want to. Thank you all very much. <laughs> okay. Have a good day. Thank you. Okay, and then um, go ahead, Jimmy. <laughs> okay.